Hey, hello everyone. Uh, this is the second series of uh, talks of Chapsapos Quarantine series. Uh, we have uh, uh, architects from PYHT, Shavir and Arin. Uh, they're the principal architects for PYHT. They graduated in 2010 and uh, uh, they started the practice in 2011. So uh, PYHT primarily practices with, uh, uh, you know, uh, sustainable and uh, context-based architecture, like they have it in their name itself, called Bioarchitects. So without uh, further ado, like welcome both of you. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much Hi. for uh, giving us the opportunity to host you today. And uh, yeah, the, uh, just to start off with, I think we'll first like straight away get into their work to, uh, to get a feel of what their practice is all about. And then we'll start with the questions. So yeah, please take the stage, <laughs> guys. Cool. Thanks, Akshay, for having us and to everyone listening in. Hello. Um, so we call ourselves Put Your Hands Together Bio Architects. And we say that Put Your Hands Together is a bio architectural firm that designs within the ecosystem, engages with community, and builds with local and natural materials. That's Shavir and me. Um, we are the co founders of Put Your Hands Together and um, partners in crime. Wow. <laughs> and that makes it true since both of us are together. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so we're gonna run you all through some slides of our process, and then we'll show some images of some of our completed and ongoing works. Um, this is some place in Manali. Some place is a homestay. Akshay, you had the opportunity to visit it, so you know yeah. this place um, quite well. Um, so the so, pizza oven is still there though. Sorry? sorry? Is it still there? The pizza oven? Is it being it's used? It's still there. It's still there. Yeah. I don't know if it's being used. Oh. <laughs> is it coming? We tried to use it once. They did. Okay. okay. Huh. Cool. So um, I'm, I'm going to explain our thought process right from starting. You know, we, we went to site first, the first time in January. And this was, these were site conditions. This is on the way to site. And it like really, really heavy snowstorm, um, almost two and a half, three feet of snow in very, very different conditions than what we've ever been to. The clients were a couple from uh, Bombay who wanted to move there and set up this homestay. And so this is, um, you know, act, the actual site. Uh, that's our clients ahead of the, the dog. And this is us trying to find a pathway into you know the site for the first that was my first time on site and all these trees you were seeing are part of an it's an apple orchard it's really really green and luscious right now um mm -hmm. if you you know log on to their instagram handle you'll be able to see that it's called someplace manali so we generally try and look at things in a, in a way of like intuition instinct and reason and then we, we try and study the site surroundings and the context around. In this case, you have these fantastic mountains because we're in a valley. So you have mountains on, on all sides almost. Um, and uh, the, the new forms of architecture that are you know taking shape, which are these two uh, buildings, they're now like hotels and they cater to larger groups that come and want to have some downtime at Manali. And um, we also then study, for example, the vernacular architecture. Manali in particular has a really, really fascinating form of traditional vernacular architecture. It's a system called Kathpuni, which is alternating layers of timber and stone without any mortar joining it. And um, these, the system is actually known to be earthquake resistant in its, in its built. And Manali is a zone five uh, is in zone five of earthquake zone. So it's really, really contextual. And they design it in a way of use usability is that the cattle used to be on the ground floor. So the heat generates up to the first floor where they would stay, you know, and they try and trap in the heat as much as possible. So um, we try and learn from these techniques. And what we have realized in, in many, many years of us working in this field is that this pure vernacular form that has evolved over many, many years of trial and error, not only um, adapts, has adapted to its material use, its climate so well, but also 
there there's, there's some details you know in in the proportions or in the um, in the scale that are so so nice that we try and learn from that and create a new form of architecture with those values in mind so coming back to our site we, we this is our actual site we have these huge boulders on the site and um, these boulders uh, we started looking them at, at them as two things basically as resources to be used as part of the design process and also can it be material to be used for construction so what we started doing then is we, we selected some of these boulders and we started the idea of material transformation so we we got in some local stone uh, breakers and then this is a process of breaking down stone um, into these larger chunks that you can see that's fallen down on the side and then further down into smaller chunks which eventually get broken down to you know really small uh, not really small but building blocks that are handed of handleable size by the mason because that's important that they, sh they should be able to lift it up and place it so these are the masons just shaping the stone finally so this process takes time but it gives a really really um, amazing satisfaction that 19 percent of our building material you know or all or our all our walls and foundations are from the site itself not not even from outside the site I and uh, yeah use the cursor to point at something and if you want to move it on the side while not using it. sure okay thank you and um so we we then use these um learnings come back to our table in in our studio in bombay and we do we make a lot of physical models and uh, we rely more on physical models and say um, technological models if that's what we call them i don't know 3d uh, digital models yeah digital models but now we're sort of integrating them both in our practice we make a lot of hand drawings and hand sketches we sometimes we present it to our clients in, in hand drawings actually um and and so we started the the construction on site so um this particular boulder is one of them that we retained on site and what we what we designed is that we we designed one structure to be wrapped around this boulder so what you're seeing here is the foundation done and um this apple tree we we really at, i think there were only one tree that was um that had to be you know sacrificed all i think two other trees we're trans you know, we're transplanted, um, but we try our we tried our level best to not, you know, to be as integrated with nature as possible. So we're wrapping the structure around this boulder, and then the next photos you see they are 18-inch thick stone walls with cement mortar. But the cement, if you can see over here where my cursor is, the cement doesn't reach the edge completely, and um, we have. Into uh, at certain gaps, we have vertical reinforcement, especially at the corners, to add some structural integrity that fixes into the slabs uh, later on. So this is one structure that then you can see it now. It's got it has its ground and first floor ready here, and most of the openings are facing us, the larger ones rather. And this is the south, so um, it's designed such that it can uh, get a lot of heat gain. Um, and this is the entrance for this, this room here and the entrance for this room here at the ground floor. And then the entrance for both the first floor rooms are from the back, which is the top of the boulder. And these are four different rooms that the, um, the clients will let out, are letting out rather. And so this is an, it's all towards completion where you have the wooden uh, windows and not all of them are openable so we played with that some of them are fixed glass some of them are openable and um, yeah, moving on this is a little blurred this photo i'm sorry for that pixelated uh, it's got sent to us on whatsapp so um, it's more recent this is the, the view of the structure the same structure from the first floor now so because the site is contoured and because the boulder itself is on you know it uh, it's fixed in in a in a way that 
it's, it creates different levels. We've tried to use that as much as possible on site. So this is the entry now to the first floor over here. This is a, the, another structure that we've done on site. So this is another two rooms. There's one room on top here and one room at the ground here. This is the access, the steps, access it to the uh, rooms on top. And this is really fun because there are two balconies here where my mouse, mouse is. It's actually a really, really small balcony. It's meant for maybe one person to stand, two people to stand and one person to sit, let's say. So it's actually a single person balcony and the access for these balconies gives you a fantastic view. It gives you a view of Rota and um, really cold winds come from there, but the view is fantastic. And um, what it does is that um, you have the one on the right that you can see here, you have to access it from the bathroom. So actually when you're brushing your teeth or maybe even if you have the guts when you're having a shower and you want to keep the door open, <laughs> You could, and then, and then the one on the left is something that you climb out from the bed. So you can see it's actually a window and we've created, it's not a mistake, it was intentional that the idea of like, just create some fun, you climb out from the bed to a balcony. So like the window is like the headboard, comes where the headboard is for the bed. So you kind of just crawl onto the bed and so you can sit on the window at the same level while you're sitting on the bed, like on the bed. So it's, it really kind of creates an interesting way to interact with uh, the outside. Yeah. This structure is um, actually the first thing you you will see when you enter the, the the site, and we've you can see that some of these boulders here are retained, and we had retained them with the ideas that you will walk on top of the boulder. So we're supposed to actually connect these boulders with the bridge of sorts, and um, we wanted people to when they when they enter the space to experience that connection with the boulder instantly. And with the with the with nature instantly, so you're actually walking through the orchard and on top of these boulders, and then you're supposed to reach this level, you know, from the boulders itself, and then walk up to the reception area, which is over here, and then this is the dining area and the common space out here, and the ground floor um, is the kitchen and the staff room and the storage room, and behind this we made the pizza oven mm. with our chair. <laughs> With a lot of other people. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> very good team. Very, very nice people. It was one of our um, really, really fun uh, workshops. We really had a great time with that. Yeah, yeah I'm glad you... all... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we were glad to have you there as well, man. This is this is the same. Uh, these are two structures, the last two that we explained. So the dining hall on the right hand side over here, and and. The reason for aligning it in this way also is that you get a view of the entire site from here and also you get a view of the valley from from on the south and then you can see now the view of the north which is Rotang on the other side so it's it's fantastic in that sense and we try to strategically place the windows in such a way that you can only see the mountains and the trees and try to avoid seeing the other built form because honestly it's not very very beautiful in, in our in our eyes and um and this is yeah we already explained actually this I, one thing i didn't uh, probably notice before is that especially the restaurant block the one of the hmm. back building you can see through both the videos and windows and see the mountain at the back actually yeah 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 and even the window on the left room through the window yeah. you can see the little triangular window of the yeah. the roof behind and see through it oh wow yeah, you can get a sort of straight visual connection through and through. That's yeah. Cool. So this is a great point that we are also learning new things sometimes when we uh, see photographs again of our structures. So this is one of the rooms from the inside. What we did is the stone, um, the gaps in the stone the masonry were filled with mud and um, the reason for that is to prevent any air gaps and also to prevent any insects from creeping in. And we've, we tried to create these uh, skylights on top. I remember in one of the workshops, the participants, one of the participants were really keen for like having a glass skylight so they could see snow falling on them. But we, we couldn't do glass, so we did acrylic instead. And um, we, we tried to create these you know, built-in furniture, because in 
in our idea the uh, in our sort of vision we feel that having built in furniture that's fixed or you know even these niches here where we have shelves and the bed it, it adds a sense of grounded like rootedness which we feel is adds then like coziness so and and when you are really cold outside in the winter you really want to come in and just snuggle um that was the idea behind this and you can see the windows over here on the right there you know two shutters we tried to play with the proportions it's, a, it's another um, room the, on the ground floor and then now you can see the the niches are of a different style over here we've done mud plaster over here this ceiling is not um contrary to what a lot of people think when they see it it's not a ceiling of uh, tin sheets but we used the tin sheets for shuttering and to to create some texture from what would otherwise be a very uh, mundane concrete slab so it's a concrete slab uh, exposed concrete slab but with the finish of a tin sheet and we really like the texture corrugated sheet yeah corrugated sheet yeah i think and what 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 how it works really well also because it's the all the surfaces are really hard and the spaces are large so i think that kind of creates some sort of uh, sound uh, doesn't absorb but it at least disperses the sound yeah and what we've tried to do is this is our main entry door actually here and you enter from here and that's on one level and then you climb up and there's a second level here and then the third level is the bed this whole thing is a bed it's a massive bed actually you can fit a whole family in there but it's a, it's really a lot of fun and it this is the part where it, behind the photographer is where the um the stone is actually the boulder which I'll the next photo yeah the next photo again is slightly pixelated um mm. so this is the boulder here that you can see and it's part of the room here there's a niche with you know um the bed here again that's fixed in this is the the bathroom area where we actually hand carved this basin that you're going to see in this slide so um our architect on site he noel he carved it out of um, the stone and it's really really well finished i don't think we have a photo in this presentation of that we have to upgrade that so that was our process to explain how you know we are on site and this is now we're going to show you run you through some of our other projects this is neral a place called sagonabag it's an agro tourism center so this is what we made and designed it's on the um banks of a man made pond and um it's made out of adobe we'll get to more detail of that but you can see the landscape changing at the back which is these are the hills of mathiran and then you have this this insane now concrete development that's almost like inching closer to this <laughs> and we mm -hmm. hope it doesn't keep coming coming in um so we started mapping some of our um projects and to to try and say track the impact we've we've we we've hope to have created and these are the different projects that we've done so there's completed projects there's ongoing projects and there's initial learning so for example my initial learning was in bihar shavi's was in bangalore and um then there was uh, we also ha had a trip to bhutan that was part of our initial learning with the other co-founders and so i'm going to run you through some of these we've done like rural pro uh, housing projects in gujarat with in collaboration with um other uh, organizations we've um, done you know um, a small project in just outside udaipur and of course our manali project and then a lot of projects around in and around maharashtra which has been you know where we are and um, more tropical um, tropical weather and climatic conditions this is um one of our favorite projects which is the nirvana farmhouse at khadavli um we've done this entire project out of compressed stabilized earth blocks and this house is uh, it's really really simple in plan it's like a how do you describe it child an o in plan with a central courtyard and we have three rooms and a kitchen and a, a, an enclosed living space that's on your left and an open living space that's on the front 
and we have this amazing jacuzzi just in the courtyard with a um, frangipani um, tree and when you enter this house where we are standing is where you get the whole expanse of the you know the site where he's grown the client has grown a lot of trees and it's actually a ri- the river bhadra which is which um, is in the background and the csebs are uh, basically compressed stabilized earth blocks that were built on site made on site with a uh, press and you can see now a photo from the other side where this open living space can get closed down with these um rolling shutters that we have over here but the rolling shutters are of a grill so that you can still see through and uh, at the same time you get your privacy and there's a lot of lot more detail that we're not going to right now but um one thing i do want to say is that the last monsoon was really really brutal in maharashtra and the um the river bhadra actually f- flooded um when they released the dam waters they had to and this happened at night and and because of this even though we are on the highest part of of the site the the water came to around this level here um where my mouse is can you see it yeah so, so the water came to around this level here and stayed there for several hours i'm not sure whether it's 6 hours or 8 hours or even 12 hours because we heard the different um, scenarios where, but it stayed for a really really long time and um what and then when the water receded we we were really scared when we when we came to know about this because it's a mud house and um but but we were we were really really relieved that there was like no damage to our walls and these walls are load bearing walls of earth with slight stabilization of cement and we've we've done a wet strength test which means we knew that it would pass two days of absor- uh, immersion in water without any problems but to see it actually happen and to know that a mud house has survived what most people cite as the biggest challenge which is water right mm-hmm. and and we've seen that it does no damage yeah the electricals were damaged slightly a lot of furniture was i mean in terms of the property damage it was severe but to see our uh, built form surviving this was a true uh, testament to how amazing actually building with earth is i think that would have given even the clients a lot of confidence for sure it clients a lot of confidence and for us it it then gives us a unfortunately this situation uh, but has become fortunate for us because mm. it gives us a um, a point of reference to say that look we yeah, know that happened. exactly and we know that water can be challenging but if we build in this technique there's also proof that it mm. can see floods overnight and still survive in a worst case scenario because mm-hmm. with climate change it's really becoming worst case scenarios so correct yeah, yeah that's yeah and that's we we did get it checked with a structural engineer also just to make sure you know so mm-hmm. he also kind of confirmed that there was no structural damage at all yeah we got a sign off on that so it was really gratifying in that sense that you know okay what you're working towards is something nice the next project um, is a collaboration between alaya and associates in calcutta whose chief architect is sharan lal and um, tham impressions collaborative who from whose team manu had joined us on this project and um, post the earthquake in in nepal we got together and sharan had designed a prototype and because of manu and uh, and our experience in bamboo and in nepal because we had already been there for some relief work um you know we we collaborated and we built this prototype in in, in this village in kaule in nepal where we trained artists and trained well unskilled labor to now become skilled labor in bamboo construction so the ground floor is following their local technology of uh, building the local construction style which is of rubble and and mud mortar random rubble and mud mortar mm-hmm. but with modifications of timber bands at at three different places the with these timber windows nice thick stone walls and then we have bamboo columns here that go up and uh, hold up the roof and um a bamboo wattle weave walls so everything on the first floor is now bamboo and super lightweight and so this structure 
then gets mud plastered and finished with these sheets unfortunately there are now lack of better roofing options especially so remote um and it's cheap it's very very uh, durable and it's very very light and easy to travel with especially when you are in these mountains um and so um we did this prototype and we received the the hutco award for this project and this project also then um you know passed all subsequent testing to um be earthquake resistant and to be officially part of the um the government's um, reconstruction plans this was one of our first projects and um, um it's in it's the one of the projects i showed you from the from the drone which was in the adobe house in neral in sagunabau and this is a agro tourism center we built this out of 14 inch thick adobes i think or 12 inch thick shall we um Drawals. walls um 14 Sorry, inch uh, right? yeah yeah so 14 inch thick um walls and um the idea is to recreate a rural house but in a slightly more modern way so a lot of the design elements are uh, you know meant to fit in with what people would like let's say or what they would relate to we try to create these perforated adobe jallies to aid in cross ventilation and also to give some visual intrigue as to the the, the pond that's on the other side we use stone in the wet areas and also that's the southwest where it's going to receive maximum rainfall um we most of our doors and windows are recycled and upcycled from older houses that were saved and we use terracotta flooring this is the pond on the left and you can see the the sort of jali on the right and that was the bed before i think we had there was some wardly artwork that was also done which was really really lovely this is one of our more recent um, projects it's the good karma farm house in alibag and this project is like 95% complete until corona hit yeah it took 10 to 12 days of work left yeah it was so let, but the good news is because it's in a farm and because agricultural work is still on this structure is actually already being used in the way it was intended to so which is a dry turmeric for example so uh, the two structures that um it's a there's a place for a, a room which is this and then a larger structure at the back which is a place for the farming activities and was supposed to become a kitchen and um this is designed actually a lot of it is semi prefabricated so a lot of this work was done off site first and then transferred here the stone isolated columns uh, base uh, on which our bamboo columns then come through um bamboo horizontal beams in two directions to create the base for the flooring which is all sourced from uh sh broken on ships so again upcycled timber and then we have these timber framed walls so this is one panel and then we follow the proportions of the panel would have an opening all panels have an opening on top for the hot air to escape and we have a wattle wall here and in the case where there's a window there's a at the same proportion down there's a window uh, that ends the sill level over here so um these wattle walls then get plastered with mud and the the part above is going to be open for um, not not this gable and that gets closed uh, but the part out here is open for breathing and and the entire built form is basically there's a 6 foot veranda that wraps around each of these structures on all sides to and and the the roof comes really low down to prevent and you can see the photo now on the right hand side it comes this is around 2 and a half to 3 feet to prevent any water from coming in and prevent even heat from from coming into the house and keeping it really really cool and we have this nice gable opening over here um this is the view from inside so you can see even these windows they're all from the on um, recycled and upcycled ship um wood that we found us a, a source in bombay in darukhana and even this wood here is 
from the from the ship so it's actually weathered wood seen from all over the world we have some i mean it has upgraded the the project has upgraded from here we've finished the the wall plastering is done but i don't have any really high res photos to share right now and this is another ongoing um, project in we were about to cast the first floor slab it's a weekend uh, second home let's say not a weekend home but second home it's uh, in a place called titwala which is very close to khadavli where we saw the compressor block uh, house and this we're doing rammed earth and we have load bearing rammed earth walls that um, 16 are 16 inch thick slightly stabilized i think what 5% shall we About seven seven percent. Seven percent. Okay, so seven percent stabilization, and then um, yeah, we were about to cast a filler slab on top, and then again, COVID came in. Uh, we really hope that we're able to cast a slab on top before the monsoon, because that would be great. Yeah, we were also supposed to finish this project before the monsoons come. Yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> um this was one of our earlier projects where we did a lot of experimentation and um we we used in you know these kind of materials in an interior context so this is a studio in mumbai um where we've used these paper tubes as shelving systems and also as furniture um as as our counter tops not counter tops but counter support over here and also our rollers for the drawers over here and um what we've done is on the outer they had a small terrace space so we've used bamboo to create the structural system and with the bamboo we've used recycled tetra pack sheets so we try to use these recycled uh, materials when we are working in an urban context we've also done a security we've been part of a security cabin design and build uh, where we've done um, again bamboo recycled tetra pack and we've used they use something called eco bricks which is basically plus uh, these re old uh, pet bottles that have been sh filled with shredded um, plastic and um, i think plastic and aluminum waste that basically nothing happens with that um and this was some, a first time we actually did rammed earth this is something we're really, really proud of because we use rammed earth as a as a counter in Crawford market which is say the busiest market and the old the most oldest most glorious market in in bombay and we've done a an earth intervention inside this market and all the shelving systems also we try to i think is a golden ratio one of the ratios we try to um, you know follow uh, our proportions and they cut up our shelves and then this has a cut up our top so we try to be as close to um, you know even in these interior settings as close to natural materials as possible and then the last project that we're going to talk about is a homestay in nasik this is it's really away from nasik actually far far away from nasik and this is also one of our really really um we it's a really special project to us because we've all the earth material is from the site so it's a technique called cob that you are seeing where this person is standing so these are cob walls which are basically um, round balls of mud that are stacked on top of each other and then are shaped um, in in any way you want it to be all the doors again and windows are from uh, are, have been purchased from uh, a dealer who was dealing in second hand doors which is why you can see some of the some gaps on top of these doors because the sizes were all different um the stone foundation the stone plinth and the stone walls that you're seeing on the right hand side are from two places one is the stone is from a quarry within a few meters from the site itself and it, when i say quarry i mean like a really small tiny co local quarry and the rest of the stone especially these um that you can see here now on, on the in the bottom left these shaped stones of different colors they are actually from a broken down house in devlali which is just a few um few about 60 kilometers 60 kilometers away from from the site so we really really source material and our clients are really really sensitive to this as well which is why they have also gone out of the way so they source the the the, the window dealer they source the um 
you know the stone so this was really helpful because a lot of times some clients they are dependent on us to source all these materials but in this case the clients are so on board with, with what we want to do that they themselves start sourcing for these materials and it adds a different uh, you know thing to the site and and um, what we've done over here is their bamboo it's a bamboo green roof so um, you can see that even in these photos here it's a green roof and the it's three sorry gone it's a flat bamboo green roof yeah a flat bamboo green roof and the idea is that when you uh, walk on the site it's actually on a, you walk on from the highest point and and you see these three that are slightly like they're integrated into the the contours and so it doesn't like hit your eye and doesn't op, like hurt you it sort of seamlessly integrates into the natural landscape and we try to make the most of the tree that's existing on site and because it's really hot in the summer so we get lovely shade in, in that part you know with this yep so that was a bit of our work thank you very much for watching and listening in case uh, we have body which i hope we have it uh, then I, i think it's sorry about that it was uh... <laughs> very uh, nicely put together and it was very elaborate explanation also so thank you for that again uh, like one thing which struck me could be like as a universal question for the entire like work process and all this like whenever you're getting into like you could see a pattern in the projects of every project having its own own uh, macro process but at the end of its own unique micro process also uh, related to the techniques like in the latest project you spoke about the uh, bamboo before that uh, you know we are talking about the farmhouse where you know it was also used as a storage area and then the different bamboo details over that then we have stone works and we have rammed up works and we have cob works we have different kinds of techniques involved in all of them and the process itself is driven with uh, a lot of those techniques itself so my question is uh, when you get into all of these i'm assuming a, at least a few of those things you'd be doing for the first time like at least the micro techniques and all of that so how do you deal with this experimentation is it like uh, uh do you like talk to a lot of people who have already done it before or is it some book knowledge mixed with you know some on site practice and then you having a knack for these kind of works and kind of developing a lot of things on site how is that process like like you know realizing from a sketch to a handmade model to you know i'm sure a lot of things organically change on site for such projects also how is that process like so uh, one is like uh, like in architecture when you study you realize there are no textbooks so yeah so for this answer also there is no one particular answer huh. but i think the if the universe if i try to give one answer to this is doing it with your own hands is mm -hmm. the way that you can you going to know okay no matter what techniques you read how many videos you watch how many mm. work, like how many experts you talk to unless you do it with your own hands you're not mm. going to know what exactly goes into it so i think that's like i would say if i to very very briefly answer that question mm. secondly mm. yeah so every project uh, we want to we want to try all the we want to try all the techniques so we <laughs> try to okay Does Ramdath make sense here? So Ramdath is like one of the last last one that we saw. But the, this is our first Ramdath house. Okay. The first opportunity when the Crawford Market came on and we like let's do Ramdath counter. We were really excited because we mm. wanted to try it since a long time. We had done so many workshops with it. I had done a workshop. I had attended a workshop with it in Ramdath. So we were like, okay, now enough hands on. We have to try it. So it mm. always comes down to first, you know, teaching yourself. Where uh, first it starts with obviously talking to people visiting seeing it then reading a bit about it expert and then it comes down to small experiments like the first ramdot thing we did was actually just such a small block like literally by mm. by this mm. and we were so excited by even that so yeah, i mean we were like wow it was just 2 inches we ramed it was so we were ramed yeah. at 2 inches and we were super happy we were super <laughs> happy It actually does be really exciting, even the counter, because I think, I mean, you you might say that that is the first rammed out count rammed out counter in that market ever made. So 
like i'm sure that's the case so that was pretty exciting because you're no, in introducing the market something. for sure i think it's like the first ramp that used in commercial place in bombay oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah high chances for that also yeah we are claiming it man <laughs> um one of the things is uh, you know you mentioned it's all of the above we when we talk to people we talk to and people range from we'll talk to people who've done this before we'll talk to our colleagues and contemporaries we'll talk to um, our artisans our craftsmen we talk to everyone to evolve a certain certain thing it's not that it's that the dance is fixed and as shavi said the most important thing is just doing it by your hands and you know best after you've done it Yeah, everyone's opinion is uh, respected even the you know mason to labor even the someone lifting something from a certain place to another place yeah for sure but sometimes they give random opinions like get married so we have to we have to, we have to... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. like when i moved into my own house my carpenters like hey sab lagta hai aap shaadi karne wale <laughs> so we have to filter some of these these opinions and their advice but a lot of it is very valuable of course and there's a lot yeah, of yeah. we afford them we we give them a lot of trust and um and it's repaid with you know yeah. for the most part yeah. like yeah, another thing actually our ramble shuttering from actually now we are doing a second project which is for another architect our shuttering design has changed because of the feedback and the interaction with the with the guys who are working so the same guys are yeah. working so they said like like uh, in the previous one these things didn't work and caused these problems so we could do it like this and it will solve the problem so we actually hmm. modified the shuttering and now it does work a lot better i think uh, in terms of ramp earth also that's the most crucial aspect the shuttering itself more than anything yeah your ramp earth is only as good as your shuttering yeah <laughs> Uh, uh another thing is like uh, uh, i mean before we started the conversation we did talk about uh, you know uh, your transition from you know the early like the 2010 11 12 period 13 where you just started off your practice and then now it's become more of you know you're more settled in the practice you're more recognized with, uh, about what you do you you are also giving back what you've learned to younger people so uh first the first thing the first question is about the financial aspect of it because i mean obviously uh it might differ from person to person but some people do get into architecture for them to make a living out of it also so especially when you work on these things like i have worked only on one such project i know and i know how much time it takes and i know how much like shavir was telling you need to do a lot of hands on things you need to figure out a lot of things on your own uh like i'm not trying to complicate the whole thing but there is definitely a point about you know initially it is a struggle to you know get the finances together and since you have gone through the process of you know uh not concentrating on finances so much and eventually making it more of a wow. livelihood based practice so how is that like like Uh, many people who would want to get into earth based and context based and all uh, and these kind of works i have seen a few youngsters back out of it because of you know financial repercussions and and there some for some people they're not you know lucky enough to practice it because there are some other family pressures also so how is that like like what is your advice to younger people who's getting into practices like this even for me like I mean, I, I I look up to you guys for a lot of your works. Like, if, even though we don't have these conversations that often, I do go on to some of your pages and you know try decoding how that was done because we can kind of decode things even through pictures. So, what's your advice on this whole dilemma about finances and you know, yeah? Are you answering or me? Ah, uh, both of yeah. you like. Okay, so yeah, one thing is for sure that uh, me and Arin, if I can talk for say for for him also, is that we didn't have that uh, fa- initial family pressure for mm-hmm. being a earning member or to contribute towards that. So like for lucky, not that we both either of us come from a very wealthy or that background, but we I would also say that we didn't have that responsibility. Yeah, so we did. That was a big huge kind of. Uh, Even that was we had, and secondly, 
yeah i mean it was very difficult we also had to make a living out of uh, out of uh, this sorry one second so should i continue <laughs> while he's asking everyone Uh, all his audience members to be quiet. <laughs> Shavi has a great audience. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. So, uh, yeah, so we also had to make a living out of. Sorry, this. just noticed the moment he started talking about money, everyone was like, "Hey!" <laughs> no, they were having their own, they were having their own conversation. so we also like we also had to make a living out of it and initially it was extremely difficult so how to answer how we managed initially is that we tried our hands on a lot of other things also alternative things like one of the easiest things to do was to teach so we did do a little hmm. bit of part time teaching hmm. and secondly is i think really being patient and perseverant about knowing that you're going to make it and it is a lot of sacrificing like uh, there was a time in my life where i knew i had only 30 rupees a day to spare for spending on myself for like fun and entertainment mm-hmm. like after if i take all my expenses out i had 30 rupees a day so you will see those days and mm-hmm. you if you if you are really passionate about that you really want to do this and i think that's not only true for this that's for any profession like if you really want to follow your passion and do something different and do something alternative and really follow what you really believe in you will have to make if not financial lot of other sacrifices also so i think that's that's how we kind of pull through it and like luckily for us we had a we are great friends also first and we kind of supported each other in a lot of ways so that's what pulled us through i guess yeah i think he's hit you know covered everything it's i mean the only advice is that we followed what we really really believed in and mm-hmm. and what we really love to do to be honest like even if today you ask us you know why are we doing what we do it's because we love it it's not because of anything else it's like we have a, we, we really enjoy it and for us that is the most important thing and yeah there are of course days when it's really difficult if, like you see what what's in your bank and you know the kind of is anyway in the field of architecture not it's not the most i would say where people are earning lots of money and like if if we look at our friends who were in school with us who didn't do architecture um you know that's it's a huge spectrum difference so sometimes you may feel in, in insecure or you may feel that what the hell am i doing in my life you know um, is it the right thing to do all these questions do creep up but at the end of the day if you have that that passion that commitment and that uh, perseverance um then there's nothing better than that i would say mm. and i can tell you first hand that shavi especially shavi out of all of us he had really good opportunities to make a shit load of money okay <laughs> uh, and and i am down what money that like you would be like are you stupid to not take that like it, you know there is there is money which is like yeah i'm tempted to take that and then yeah. there is money where even if you have a passion you feel like take that and come back to your passion <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know do that for a while and then come back to passion sacrifice your passion there, there was that kind of um there was the, you know that was an offer for him and to be able to say no to that when you are at that 30 rupees a day or whatever mm-hmm. and, and you know you are able to do that that requires a lot of uh, yeah. yeah honestly i was sure i was sure he's going to take <laughs> that opportunity of money <laughs> <laughs> now you know i feel like oh why didn't i <laughs> <laughs> no i don't actually yeah. but sometimes you think oh what if yeah, just what? like you are really yeah, yeah those like, thoughts are always <laughs> i knew where that was going shavi yeah <laughs> uh, uh another like more broader question i think like uh, uh in terms of uh, uh following your passion and you know not letting anything else uh, uh stop you from doing it and and i think one very important word what chavi told was patience i mean it's not going to happen i mean in this field particularly this kind of work it's not going to happen even in a years or two years time it takes longer like people expect to move things faster because it's not just your peer architects who are making 
that kind of money or anything it's also people who have studied in schools <laughs> who have tech jobs and you know <laughs> these mainstream jobs i mean frankly you know make a lot of money uh, it's those kind of pressures right like yeah uh, like he said i think patience is super super important like you need to need to know that your journey is a bit different and it's it's not like you can't really compare it with others it's just a different journey and you need to like respect that and accept that and move on with it uh uh going forward with like a broader question is like we have there's always this question about can these kind of practices be may more mainstream and more at a larger scale uh we don't see it happening that often uh we do have some examples across india you know there's a lot of practices in oroville there is you know biome architects in bangalore and then we have uh, didi contractor also who's I, i won't say mainstream but at least you know uh, branched out to like uh larger uh, projects and uh, and then we have rinmai and uh, such consultants who have been working in this field of work from very very long and they've done a lot of r and d and frankly a lot of that also has helped uh, uh, uh practices like yours and uh, so the question over there is do we have like a good future and looking at the whole uh, uh, uh covid 19 crisis also throwing light on uh, how we how we live as human beings and also are uh, people looking at uh, how it's affected the climate like you're talking about himalaya seen from jalandhar and you know such beautiful things and uh, i mean i do have a fear of people just going back to their usual lives like human beings are like that like once things get normal we do move on pretty quickly but at the same time there is an alternate path we can take and obviously practices like this only support things like that and the more specifically context based architecture i'm not talking about rand earth or you know i'm not talking specifically about stone or anything so can something like this be made mainstream uh, because you also see on parallel you see in china that you have these brick making machines we are talking about compressed stabilized earth bricks you see in china they are compressed stabilized earth brick machinery with like a with like a ch- supply chain where bricks come out much faster than we do so small things like that do we have a space in the industry with these kind of works can it be made more mainstream faster and can more people be exposed to such things i'm talking about the common public because that's the only way i i see something like this making a much greater impact i mean we can affect like 0.5 or 1% of the population but the question is can it affect more can more people be aware of these things can it be made more mainstream and how can that be done i well uh, i mean there are whole like layers and series of of things that you know mm-hmm. that you've touched upon um mm-hmm. one is this question of scalability okay? correct um and and i think a major issue is that we live in cities and that mm-hmm. we feel that if it cannot be applied to a city this concept is flawed okay a lot correct. of general public especially it's a common question as you mentioned it everywhere we've spoken there will be this question that crops up that can it be adapted to the cities our cities mm-hmm. are failed man mm-hmm. <laughs> i mean we are we are stuck in like these concrete boxes for the last one and a half months not mm-hmm. able to be connected to nature uh, for most people in the city most people like in in, in bombay they we live in extremely dense uh, not a hygienic condition some of don't, don't have access to food don't have access to water etc etc so a city i think the concept of cities in my opinion is like is flawed um i'm waiting for this to end so that i can reconnect with nature to be honest i think mm-hmm. if anything this has taught us it's that we need to slow down um um our our sort of this is my opinion like i could be wrong but i think that this has given us a great time for us to rethink what we're doing question how we want to do it sort of um you know just take a deep breath you know we're we're only one and a half months into this if you think about like let's assume mm. that hopefully we live for 60 years it feels much longer though yeah it feels yeah. much longer but let's hope that we live for 60 years or even if we live for like 40 years what is one and a half months in in that much time it's not a lot you know and we're already like we're like fish out of water Mm. <laughs> and and it's 
it's definitely going to be longer this thing this transition and i feel that we just need to we need to relook into everything our our lifestyles our what is our idea of development what is our um, you know for me this answer is it's there's not an answer it's a it's the whole layers of lot of things and i don't know if you know we have the approach charted out or planned out as of now mm -hmm. uh, something i'm still like sitting with i am wondering um because um i don't know it's complicated right now when we talk about what what is the future like mm -hmm. so i would have given you a different answer maybe pre covid but but no, let's consider things are going to like you know normalize much faster like like so i would like to just uh, like what is like arin said a very good thing that uh, we consider that only home if it only if it can be adapted to a city that it is considered mainstream where that's not true like so one is that yeah we choose our own battles and where you want to find them and why where you, how much you want to how much of an impact you want to create so so, so first is that secondly is that uh, i genuinely believe that yeah everything is going to go back to the way it was yeah <laughs> i think maybe a few people might bring on some change in their lives as to how they see things and be a little more conscious but 99% of it is going to go back to the way it was like people are talking about is world trade going to reduce yeah mm -hmm. i mean i heard one economist say that it's not going to be uh, be affected at all people are going to trade the way they've been trading because china is not going to let that happen <laughs> Hmm. yeah and third is like i mean maybe we are not doing it right now where we are creating such a big impact that we can contribute towards climate change or whatever but there are people who are like there are people uh, like good earth in bangalore who make uh, commercial projects with using sustainable and uh, eco friendly materials hmm. there is uh, dharmesh in oroville who who is do, who are doing like really large projects and sanjay prakash who are doing Large scale commercial government projects in eco friendly and natural materials and rammed earth. So there are people who are doing it. So I mean, we would also love to do it, but uh, right now we are. I would like let's say we are not getting those projects right now. If it if it comes to that, but if we do, you we will definitely. I don't know. I don't know what the future is. It's very. Difficult. I really hope that it's like. Not ninety nine percent going back to normal, man. It is ninety. <laughs> like our normal was really flawed. <laughs> don't you think so? Uh, I mean, I don't. No, man. I even I don't want to throw any negativity onto it, but like I frankly think that human beings move on very quickly. Like it's not that easy for human beings to move on. Like we will talk about this. I mean, see any pattern. Like you see anything, even when the for example, Krita uh, Thunberg thing happened. Like after that, once media's attention shifted to something else, people moved on. Like it's not like people hold on to it. It's more of like when you start feeling like you're part of a global organization, like how so what I, happened, Hamburg and all that. So what people is, right now, all these conversations are coming up more than even before. I hmm. don't think it's because we are at a crisis situation. I think it's because hmm. millennials are entering into position of power. like one mm. of the tra like trait they say of millennials is that they want to do something where they can create an impact where they can make a difference that's the kind of places that millennials want to work in hmm that is the whole trend even in the corporate sector they say that that's how you kind of so once millennials start becoming policy makers mm. when basically when millennials turn 60 years old mm. that's when you'll see it becoming policy that's when you'll yeah. see And I, and 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 you think only then we'll start seeing change more on a global level than I I I kind of is my theory. I'm really it. hoping that this uh, everyone's gonna change their life after COVID. Five percent, I think five percent is what. Yeah, at least you win. Is it by four percent? That's already a win. No, personal. I'm looking at five change their lives. Five percent. <laughs> I give it five percent. <laughs> How much? The uh, question is not about other people. Actually, the question is about each one of us. Let's say three of us in this. How much is our life going to change? I think I would hope that it's the time for us to really, really rethink. And yeah, I'm. I am thinking of getting a bike, not selling my bike, because I'm like, <laughs> shit. At this time, I really needed a personal vehicle, which I don't have. <laughs> Which I consciously decided not to. Now I'm like shit. I know. I think I need it. 
so sorry ari <laughs> no i think like i was i recently messaged you on and on our other group friends i'm like i i'm 32 i'm turning 33 later this year so i'm like out of these years 30 to 33 99.9% has been spent living in an urban environment i'm really lucky that out of this urban like out of this 99.9% like 98% has has been spent living in a village in the city so i'm from um, one of the villages in bandra which is you know my house one of my walls is still adobe friends so many so many years so um i'm very blessed in that sense to have been brought up in in a scale that's very down to earth um so i don't relate to a lot of bombay that's so high scale and um but i was just thinking if like 32 years i've lived in this urban environment i want when i die i want to spend at least like i to even say that half my life i spent in nature you know or close closer to nature so if i assume that we are going to live till because i don't know how 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 do you put a calculation on it i would say 60 65 we don't know the effects of radiation etc so that means some change needs to come in our lives now no would you want to like would you want to be like 30 years of your life in in a city in a concrete like enclosure a box look at it that way or let's say 35 years when is it going to break for you I mean, if you put it that way, then anything can seem very scary. <laughs> Thirty years living in a box. But it's true, no? It is true. Yeah, I mean, it's still. Uh, I mean, you have to. Un- <laughs> it's not just that. It's not so easy. It's not so easy. I, I didn't say it's easy. I just said it's true. No, you know, thirty years living in the middle of the jungle, just with like ten people around you. I'm not. I'm not saying to live in the middle of the jungle. I said closer I mean, to nature. Never. No. No. It's not so black and white. No, I'm just. Yeah, I think personally, like I think it's time for. I mean, there's a lot of merit in what you're trying to say, but. Yeah. Uh, but i think there is a lot of other layers also like see india and humans are social animals so our i think what uh, what i take from what he is saying is that our design or our this of a city has completely failed us to give us a balance of uh, what we desire and what we need and what we what we what we want and what we need so like like he mentioned earlier the the balance of nature and the built form built fast and like there's no space where we can just go and kind of you know like i i remember this conversation i had with one german friend of mine he said so how long do you have to drive to be able to get out of the city and go for a trek i was like at least 2 hours and he was like yeah for him it was just he and he came, he came from uh, uh, berlin he's like yeah half an hour drive and i'm out of the city i'm like no way Um, if I go on a weekend, it could sometimes take three hours, and sometimes still not out of the city. Yeah, yeah, because I am stuck in the traffic which is outside the city because everyone <laughs> trying to get out. <laughs> so that's the difference, and I think, yeah, that's where we've. I think, not. I think we failed there. But I think at the same time, there is like a downside to like. human population moving towards like out of cities also like we are, we are already a saturated population globally like yeah. we don't want uh, uh, okay like occupy more land like, probably people like aryan and all will go to a place like manali just an example to a place like manali and you know probably like settle there do practice, uh, practice architecture over there help the uh, local communities over there but if a lot of the human population starts moving out of the cities which is anyways you know going to happen at least on the periphery of the cities with all these satellite towns and all we are just uh, uh, destroying the ecosystems more because wherever human beings go they do destroy ecosystems like it's because we are no, but, we are a consumption based uh, but uh, that's where then this question comes in of scalability and of then uh, uh, can you do um, you know proper yeah. work um, that's more rooted with nature that's when people like you know send mm-hmm. up nature is required at that point so i would say yes there's always destruction in anything you do like we know mm-hmm. 
first time we did foundation we saw one snake's house going one frog's house going you know yeah. it's it's the way of life but can it be yeah. can it be kept to a minimum so that's yeah. that's the time when i would say is like yeah go outside the city you know go to these places but the architecture then or the construction then has to be very very rooted in nature so i think like to sum this entire discussion up because we like when we touched many different topics in this discussion and plus my question was also pretty complex so my bad so uh, so to just sum this entire thing up this particular conversation you have to make sure you use this time to rethink at least as us practicing in our in architecture uh, we need to see how going forward this can be more of a wider practice and become mainstream you guys obviously if you you know you just mentioned that if you get the opportunity like why not like we would take it mind mainstream but at the same time uh, uh, we also need to rethink like this we do personally in our lives like change starts from within right there is no point uh, uh-huh. talking about uh, the entire global population first talk about yourself then talk about your nearby communities and then you know start like people see and people believe and people are like okay everyone is practicing this you know it it becomes like a chain reaction right. believe in that i guess like started from within first i mean i wouldn't say shavir shown by his bike like that doesn't make sense i'm not thinking that but <laughs> the same, uh, there are definitely changes we can make like uh, uh with our practice and also with our daily li- li- livelihoods i mean right now i think we have decreased the consumption so much we know for a fact that we can survive with lesser consumption also then why do we consume so much as a question exactly yeah that's a great point yeah so yeah just like i think start from within and then go out later yeah i think so and also convince shavil that uh, got to, <laughs> to to leave the city <laughs> he is sitting beside a plant to feel connected to nature it's not plant it is some feathers <laughs> Oh shit! Oh, are those real feathers? I don't know. See, I'm at my cousin's house, so I compromised. Yeah, <laughs> real feathers. Yeah. So yeah, another very uh, 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 hot topic we we wanted to like touch in this conversation is that you guys also uh, teach in colleges. You teach architecture students, and you practice, and and you have workshops as a very integral part of how your studio works which i think is amazing because uh, you try your best to take all the works you do as also learning plat- platforms and uh, you already have like you know a challenge in your hand by uh, executing a project of uh, of a very different type and you know kind of learning the way you, you do and also try in educating people so i think that's like like a pretty complex relationship so was it a conscious decision to start uh, teaching early on in your practice or you know it just organically happened and how did workshop become a integral part of your practice like how did that part happen uh you're talking about teaching as in us teaching in uh, as in workshops right you, you teaching in colleges also because i know that both of you do teach in colleges too like so uh, talking about my education. idea about how why i started teaching is one is that for uh, two things i i really believe that teaching really helps you learn a lot mm. uh, and one of the big ways you learn a lot is because when you're trying to explain a concept to uh, someone you need to really articulate your thoughts well and put like put it in words to explain them because otherwise when we are thinking of just thinking of concepts and ideas we do not take the effort to articulate them to explain to someone else so mm. you are not really helping yourself develop that thought and idea so i think for me that really uh, that was the idea for why i would love to want to teach it so that i kind of push myself to articulate that and then students ask you questions sometimes you don't know the answers you you go and find the answers out and you learn a lot more i mean it started with as some with the idea thought like that and like i said before it was also for to supplement some sort of Uh, man, uh, income. That was where we ta- started teaching in colleges. As for workshops, uh, one of the biggest reasons why we started it is because we know what we went through while we wanted to uh, 
learn and uh, find out how these techniques are done and places we could go and learn them were very far and few so we felt that now that we know this much it is our kind of responsibility to teach as much as it is possible so that is when the that is when we decided to start take and uh, conducting these workshops yeah that's it i in anything you would like to add well uh, about the workshops i you know agree with chavi that's that's what it was and that's how it started and mm -hmm. about teaching i don't know it's something i also ask myself uh, constantly as chavi said you learn a lot about yourself it's really really it's it's that cliche you know that when a student becomes a teacher then the teachers i mean you're a student the teachers always say you know wait till you come to this side of the of the class and then you realize what it is and then you realize that damn that they were right takes a lot of effort a lot of um, a lot of preparation a lot of patience a lot of um, you you get pushed because they ask may ask questions that you don't have answers to and you have to be honest and you have to give each person the best that you can and you have to you have to sort of understand that person like what do they need do they need to be you know cajoled do they need to be reprimanded um so it really really pushes you to be someone that maybe you are not at that time or to become a better version of yourself and it just happened with me um i i one of the reasons also is that we were teaching with a really close friend of ours also who taught us fezan um he was a big reason also for me to remain to to teach because it was happening with him um and actually it became a point where i was teaching with my closest friends i was teaching with shavi i was teaching with um, mukund another really really close friend fezan and a few others and to me coming to that uh, institute and being with these people i learned a lot lot more than because we were people who were willing to push the ideas of teaching also so it it was um, you know one of those situations where it just happened and right now i'm not actively both of us are not actively teaching we do you know certain modules and certain um, maybe smaller teaching we we're not actively um, academicians at this moment and we don't know how it sort of takes shape sometimes we we dream of this idea of um teaching architecture in a new kind of way shavir wants to start his own institute since a long time um mm. to teach architecture in a in a different way and um it's it's an idea that comes to all of us and you know when you say how would you teach architecture because i think we would teach it very very differently the curriculum would be extremely different yeah how was the masters program where you just build a house for 2 years i think that should be the bachelor's program man i was i'm reading one book and he this architect uh, what's his name ulrik plesner okay, he he worked with jeffrey bauer samir gave me this book so he um he, his his learning was not in an architecture school but in a craft school so the it will be for either masons to enhance their skills or carpenters to enhance their skills or other people to learn architecture but through building i think that's so good yeah so like to some of this conversation also uh, i think both of you had like very similar points and and first of all like thank you for like taking the time out to also introduce workshops with your projects because very very few people do it and uh, uh, I, i know for sure that uh, you know it's just an extension to uh, the passion you already have about what you do and also to give back and you know probably at least in a small way change a few other minds and you know help other people that was it's definitely helped me in whatever way possible so yeah and definitely also that you know education like you teaching also helps uh, in you yourself learning and also setting things right in your practice that's true uh, so uh, yeah thank you so much for that i think it was a very uh, i mean all the three four topics we spoke about even though they are not specific questions uh, they were a, a, they were a bit more personal and a bit more broad i think it was a very elaborate uh, explanation
also some fun in between. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, just to like conclude the uh, the entire talk, like for people who this is for the viewers who will be uh, looking at it. For people who don't know much about PYHT, put your hands together as a practice. There'll be a link below after we post the video, so you can check their work out. And I hope they soon come out with the workshop once things become normal again. Definitely sign up for it. It's going to give you a lot of insight and in how these kind of practices work. So yeah, this was the second series of uh, uh, juxtapose architecture conversations. We hope we will keep doing this going forward. So thank you so much for being a part of it and Great taking your time. I think I took so much more time than we planned on, and I, I, it's it's well deserved because uh, it was a very good organic conversation. So thank you so much again for Great. giving us the opportunity. Thanks, Thanks for having us, man.